It's tough enough starting a business to meet the needs of today's world. But it's a completely different mindset when a founder expects the world to change around them. Hi, I'm Phil. I'm Amana. Steve. I'm Cindy. And my company, Remedy Health. I'm Scoot. Goalie Media is changing the world. When you're as obsessed as I am about it, it does consume you. You've got to prioritise and you've got to compartmentalise. It did absorb a lot of my life. It was all negative feedback. I came the next day to the office just crying. So why are you doing this? The objective is to change the world. We could be the biggest company in the 21st century. We all want to travel further and faster. So there's a constant need for innovation within transport. Satellites, they've essentially defined the modern age. They are the linchpin of global communications, which has basically lifted us out of an industrial revolution and into an information age that we currently live in. Satellites have the potential to also be extremely responsive, extremely maneuverable. They can have extremely long lifetimes and we can use them in a very sustainable way. Every one of us in this room currently has some form of mobile device in their pocket. Every single one of those devices almost certainly has a GPS function. If you want to call a colleague in the United States or in Finland or in South Africa or in China, that satellites will perform part of that link in the same way the navigation allows you to go from A to B. We are really at danger of sleepwalking into the next apocalypse in space. There is a lot of space debris up there, which is a hazard to other spacecraft. When they collide with other spacecraft, they're going at over 10 kilometers per second. When things collide at 10 kilometers per second, they don't break, they explode. The number of objects in space is gonna go up by a factor of 10 over the next few years, and we don't have a solution for this. You know, this is the global warming of space. I'm Mark Stokes, I'm the CEO of MagDrive. I'm Thomas Clayson, founder and CTO of MagDrive. When did you guys get into space? And I'm not talking professionally. Yeah, as a kid. Three keeping, months old or so. Yeah, <laughs> keeping track of, you know, exciting things that were happening that I felt really interested in because I had to go and find them. It's just always been part of my childhood. I remember books about black holes when I was probably way too young for them. I remember watching Star Trek with my dad when, again, I was too young for it. My first meaningful exposure to space was when I realized that sci-fi I was reading or sci-fi I was watching had a grounding in reality. I wasn't watching something which was impossible. How does that feel to now be not just working in the industry, but what you're working on would completely pioneer a new part of it? It is absolutely, it's just awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's the best job I've ever had and ever will have. It's unbelievable, and like the, the speed is the thing that always gets me. Like literally yeah. one year ago, it was us two working part time. Like we were moonlighting, we had other jobs, and now we're a team of nine. It's amazing. Yeah. Chong was mentioning just before we started just how many people in the world can do your jobs. What what sort of numbers are we talking? Well, he'll be modest, but it is about fifty for him. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> is that about right? About. 50? I, I mean, um, so I mean, we're talking like. Um, you know, uh, pulse power and plasma physics combination with like you know, good knowledge of magnetic. Me, probably, probably enough, probably enough people, but a combination of mechanical engineering, maths, project management, working in startups, robotics, aerospace. Maybe my secret is you know I haven't had a career trajectory at all, um, and now I'm here. The idea about MagDrive it initially came to me when I was looking at concepts for fusion-powered spacecraft, which. While very cool, unfortunately require fusion reactors miniaturized and put in space, which is extremely difficult. And I remember telling Mark about this. At that point, it was very much a concept and I was seeing how big this technology could go. How massive could we build something uh, with these sorts of magnetic chambers and these sorts of technologies. MagDrive is developing the next generation of satellite propulsion. We are developing a brand new, small, but extremely powerful and ultra efficient electric plasma thruster for small satellites. At the moment in the space industry, you've got chemical thrusters, which provide a lot of thrust, but very low efficiency, very low miles per gallon, if you like. It is 
very, you know, rapid and fast in terms of, you know, how quickly it moves you across town. Um, however, it's not the most efficient thing in the world. On the flip side, electrostatic propulsion gives you very low thrust, but it gives you a great deal of efficiency. The trade-off between thrust and efficiency has created a bottleneck in the industry which needs to be broken through to really have a new space age. It's going to be a huge tech challenge, right? It's almost like, you know, controlled small scale, like plasma fusion and having to control that fully magnetically without touching the plasma and shooting that out in the right direction. What it allows you to do is it allows you to both get to the orbit that you need to real damn quick and get there real damn efficiently. So you don't need tons of tanks, but you also don't need to wait six months. This is a long journey. Um, building a space company is not something that you do in a couple of years. If we're successful, we don't necessarily see an exit. There will certainly be opportunity for investors to reap the rewards through an IPO or through uh, investor swaps and so forth. But we wanted investors which join us on that journey to make a massive company, to not worry about, okay, I've got to you know, get a 2x return in two years or whatever. The space industry is so competitive at all levels, it doesn't matter whether you're a startup or a prime, it's super competitive. But that also makes it super compelling, and that's why it's also good for investment, and it's good for attracting highly skilled, uh, exciting, interesting, and ambitious people into that sector. There's like 155 launch companies now across the world that are working on bringing things to orbit. The likelihood of like, you know, a hundred of those being interesting companies, probably pretty unlikely. Like there's probably only going to be like three or four of those that turn out to be like interesting investor like outcomes. You know, we like to bet on things that if they work will be really massive. And if they do work, this is the right team to do them. When we got our first bit of funding, we worked 12 hour days. We didn't take weekends. We had so much to do and the driving force there was knowing that the returns would be there 100% for putting in the effort. In the early days, you're not very good probably at deciding what your greatest returns from certain activities is, is gonna be. So you do everything, and you do everything as well as you can because you've got no idea what the biggest moment of return is gonna be. And I've never had that level of sheer motivation and concentration before MagDrive. You know, at the end of the day, in order to build a space company, it isn't this like, you know, theoretical, oh, build the thing and then customers will come. Like, no, there's like, there's like 15 customers for this. You need to like go talk to those 15. It's not massive. This isn't like enterprise SaaS. And so they've done a great job of over the past like six months, actually establishing relationships with the eventual 15 customers, showing them the prototype data, walking them through what their technical roadmap is and starting to get those customers comfortable with like, hey, yes, if you guys achieve XYZ technical milestones, we are very excited then to use your product. MagDrive is pretty darn consuming. <laughs> um, you know, you have to be obsessed to be a startup founder. Um, I think if you aren't, it will be hard to be successful. But at the same time, I do have other things in my life. I have a child, um, I have a wife. Um, now, unfortunately, lockdown means we can't go anywhere, so I've been able to dedicate a lot more of my time to MagDrive, um, which my wife is not very happy about. I'm not one to care too much about what my personal identity is and what others think of me. Um, but I think that, you know, my, my name and personality are very much intertwined with MagDrive. There are people in my life who I want to impress, who I, I want them to see that I've done something great, which in a way is a little childlike. It's like taking your parents, uh, like, a, like a drawing as a kid. But the kind of validation from important people in your life grounds me very much to the reality of what I'm doing, which I remind myself isn't just for me. And I spent three years learning about people who lived 2,000 years ago, and what they did still affects us now. From language and law and culture, everything can be traced back to snap decisions made 2,000 years ago. And I felt like I had to do something. Bag drive is going to be absolutely crucial in enabling an entire new economy in space. Now I want this new economy in space to grow fast and I want it to grow to the size where you need humans there. In about 20, 30 years time, maybe 40 years time, there are going to be maybe five or six companies which pretty much run the solar system. MagDrive, with a propulsion system that can do things that nobody else can, will be the catalyst 
for that absolutely radical transformation with the way that humanity itself uses and interacts with space. We could be the biggest company of the 21st century. I remember myself and Heather sitting in Heathrow Airport at the end of February, start of March, and every, more people had face masks on than we, than we realised or would normally see in the airports. And then the computer system at Heathrow went down, so we spent 15 hours in Heathrow Terminal 5 trying to get out. I see that as being the, the start of the difficult period. When lockdown and global pandemic started to come in, there was a real sense of fear for, I think, 90% of the population, this was completely out of anybody's control. There was no way you could make it better. How do you shut down manufacturing? How do you shut down engineering and make it virtual? You can't. So there was definitely a, a large degree of, you know, of, of just fear as to what can we do. I, I definitely thought the lockdown was going to put the company in trouble, but you never saw fear in his eyes. So we then decided rather than growing revenues, let's grow innovation, let's grow the IP, let's take all the feedback we've had while we've been go, 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 go. I'm Dr. Dave Hughes, founder and CEO of Novasound. We're an advanced sensors company from Scotland, west coast of Scotland, selling efficiency and safety into aviation power generation and energy markets. Safety is the number one priority in aviation. We need to make sure that people get in the sky, land in the same fashion as they arrived. At the moment, the aviation industry still relies a lot on human factors in the maintenance and the repair of aircraft. A lot of it is because it's so heavily regulated, it's so conservative. Transport is one of those sectors where um, clearly there's a lot of established players um, and it's a sector that's been around for a long time. Having said that, there's a lot of changing requirements um, and a lot of innovation in the sector. There's no room for error. So what we see at Novasound is that our technology enables the efficiency of the inspection and the monitoring of the aircraft. You're a bit of a local onion, you're Glasgow oh, yeah. based, was it? I was born in Glasgow, grew up down the coast yep. uh, towards Greenock, so that's okay. the yeah. main Inverclyde area it's called, but spent most of my life, aside from a few years in Dundee. I'm, yeah. I'm, Scotland, west coast of Scotland, born, that's and right. born and bred. When you were younger then, plan was to, to be a musician? Uh, possibly, I mean it was never one that was gonna, I was never good enough to be a millionaire rock star or whatever. Was it the dream though? Was that... it, it was always the call of the wild, let's call it. Yeah, the, yeah. It was a hobby that started to pay for itself in part, but really I did want to go into science, I've always been a geek always loved been programming since I was six years old or so. Yeah. I started my academic career, University of Glasgow, degree in physics. Did that, decided I needed to get out of the core baseline science, move into applied physics, which is more commonly known as engineering. From that, I did a PhD in ultrasound for teeth, detecting tooth decay. Then started a 10, 12 year research career off the back of that. That track of career got me into being an academic and I really thought I'd spend the rest of my days in a university doing research, becoming a lecturer, a professor, and that's exactly what my parents would have loved. When he was a lecturer, he, he just wanted to do so much. He used to create extra classes for us to really push us towards what we wanted to do. He wanted to push everyone else towards a bright future and push himself at the same time. You know, it took to 10 years or the university. I'd gone to a number of them to actually get a permanent contract and you know, pinnacle of you know, an academic career is getting that permanent contract. Yep. Uh, but at the same time, I was starting to commercialise my research, which would become Novasound. And the day that we spun out from the university and created the company, I don't think my mum really understood why I would throw away a permanent academic job to go and be a founder in a scrappy startup. Dave's had to transition from the um, academic world into the business world. Um, he hasn't done that without support. You need to have a really trusted network of people around you that you trust to kind of guide and advise you because you can't know everything when you start a business. 
you need to be able to listen, you need to be able to take advice, you need to be you know, willing to grow. So when you went home to your wife and said, look, I think I should go start a business, I've got this idea and yeah. I think it'll work, how, how did that go? I think it's always, I mean, the phrase I hear a lot is, we'll see how it goes. Both my wife and I uh, appreciate that if I do this right, and, and she does her career, she's a politician, she does her career right, the payoff in the long term will be immeasurable compared to what we have to go through in the here and now. So we've been together about 12 years and we met in Glasgow in like a really dingy rock club. And the old fashioned way, no no apps, no it, it kinda of moved quickly into internet, I yeah. guess. We met face to face and then went digital. And at that point I was playing in a punk rock band and yeah. she was an enjoyer of punk rock music. We now look fifteen years on, she's a politician and I'm a CEO and we think, how the hell did this what, what, happen? What happened? This is where the brightest people in Scotland are working on, <laughs> you know, the coolest company, the ultrasound company. So it's, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, proper deep tech going on in here from the Kelpie, which is what Emma's working on here. That's our kind of flagship inspection tool. Mm. We've got our full 3D printing so that we can customise very, very quickly. A month ago, two months ago, there was a plane over Denver that yeah, had its engine yeah. all over because one of these broke. And that was terrifying. Out, and it turned, nobody died, so, you know, and nobody so, was So hurt. what happened with that, in that instance, one of these came loose and it tore so, apart the rest of it? So them, what so. it is, is, because this is spinning round and round in the jet yeah. engine, you get fractures and defects and micro cracks yeah. and fatigue happening at where, where this part is into the holder and basically this pinged off. What, what is challenging about trying to find those cracks in there is that it changes shape. You know, it goes from thick to thin and it's changing as you go down. So actually inspecting these, and if you look at them you can see the surface but you can't see what's going on inside. Yep. With ultrasound you can see inside. So you can actually scan. That's where Nova Sound comes in. It'd be great for Nova Sound to be a consumer brand. You know, we'd like that. But I'm kind of seeing the real value of Nova Sound and what drives me with impact is getting people's safety and efficiency up. And if nobody hears about us, but we're always there in the background, yeah. providing the infrastructure to keep people safe and keep people flying and keep the aircraft in the sky, etc., then I'm happy with it. Like Scotland is a brand thrives on innovation, mm. thrives on invention. If you look at MRI, telephone, TV, one of the ones people don't know much about with Scotland is ultrasound. So diagnostic ultrasound, what we see in the hospitals around the world, was actually first developed in Scotland. I was really surprised to see just how active the innovation scene is here in the, the, the central belt, Scotland. That I, I, I do actually think the mix that we've got across all the supply chain and the manufacturing side, the tech side, you know, is something that, you know, can create more value for, uh, like, like for Scotland in, in general. Most of all of our products are all manufactured in Scotland. It's creating a community in Scotland. We've always been very um, outsourced, kind of what people think of is, and we want to just show that Scotland can manufacture some pretty good technology. I would love this to go public. That, that's my big aspiration. What we're doing in the markets we operate in, aviation, energy, is game changing. You know, there, yeah. there's no doubt what we are building here has huge implications across sectors. Yes, there are challenges, um, but I think, as I say, because that technology is moving moving on at pace, and I think it's part of the, uh, the advantage in the, in the service, that broader service, if you like, in terms of pulling the ecosystem together um, across the sector that the government can, uh, can provide. You have to have the resilience to drive to get there. As soon as the drive goes, then you either have to find it again, or hang up your dancing shoes, but I'm not quite there yet. You've got to be all in, you've got to be tenacious, and uh, you've got to really have some passion for what it is that, that you're working on. And Technologies like Novo Sound are, are seeking to deploy into the market are absolutely, absolutely critical. There, there's a rush when it goes right. There's a, also a secondary rush when it goes wrong and then you fix it. But uh, a high growth, startup or a high growth entrepreneur has, wants to do it at pace and have impact.
Ever since I've been a child, I've always visited factories. Health and safety was probably not what it is today. I was wandering, so a small child wandering around a factory. But, you know, that stuff inspires you. It makes you realise what is possible. I bought him various sort of, well, now I look back on it, rather antique books on aerodynamics, and he read Flight Magazine. I mean, he read avidly. Uh, so, in a way, it started off because of of reading, um, and he was just interested in aircraft. My first real entrepreneurial activity was when I was 13 or 14. I decided that I wanted to buy an English Electric Lightning. I used to bunk off school and make phone calls to the RAF uh, to see if I could buy one of these military jets. The military were like selling them off, and they were like 3,000 quid. The Lightning was an incredible aeroplane, uh, two engines on top of one another. And he put the, the bit into the MOT and they accepted it. And then there was a sort of uh, hiatus because they said, right, OK, we accept the offer, pay us the fight 3,000 and then we, you need to come to wherever it was, this, this airfield in, uh, in Wiltshire. <laughs> and Charlie was saying, you know, where do I follow me? Where do we put it? There's a book that I was given as a kid, where we, I'd show you actually, it's called The Chronicle of Aviation and it's basically got the history of aviation. Uh, and you know it's got a, it's got a few pages on each year, and I guess the sort of the mark that we've we've properly made it is when they uh, when they write a page on us and we're sort of in there as the unmanned aviation provider, and this is where it all started. My name is Charles Tabner, I'm the chairman of FlyLogix. We use unmanned uh, aircraft to reduce the cost, the risk and the environmental impact of aviation services. So FlyLogix has already led the UK and the world in, in doing very long distance unmanned aviation flights. And we've got an enviable list of clients. So our clients include BP, Shell, National Grid, Equinor, um, you know, any one of those would be, would be a fabulous client, and we have a, a, a long list of those clients. I believe this is all about how far you managed to get away from, from a manned station, is that right? So it's significant to us uh, because it is the first beyond line of sight mission that we, we ever did at FlyLogix. At the time, basically everyone was telling us you can't fly uh, an unmanned aircraft beyond line of sight. I think part of FlyLogic's very uh, original concepts came from that, which was, I believe some people know, a bet that he couldn't do it. And he has done it. Essentially, I bet Colette that we could fly beyond line of sight to one of her assets. She said to me, oh, you can't do it. And I said, yeah, like, you know, you give me a contract, we'll do it. He took on that challenge and came back to me about four, three years later with um, the first uh, prototype. So this is one of our aircraft that does, does the work we do in the North Sea, doing emission monitoring. So, um, so it's about three, meter, about three meter wingspan, weighs about 50 kilograms with all of the equipment on it. And it's incredibly capable, it flies 500 miles. Oh my God. There's an incredible amount of communication equipment in it so that you can that talk to it, top? all in the top yep. there. So you can talk to this plane anywhere in the world and fly it from here anywhere in the world. We build the aircraft, mm. we write the software, we've built the communication system, we train our pilots, we write our safety cases, we do everything. And, and I think if you want to build a real engineering business, you've got to do that whole vertically integrated thing, but it's painful. From an engineering point of view, it takes a bit of artistry, you know, what do I need to pull together to make this fulfill the need that we have? Because individually we know the bits exist, but do they all talk to each other nicely? Do they all play nicely together? Can we make them robust, reliable and dependable? Aviation's got a massive problem, which is there's lots and lots of energy consumed flying stuff around. And so the only way you can really make a big difference is to do lots of it on a smaller scale. A lot of new technology, you know, come up against different challenges. It's beyond just the industry. You've got the CAA, you've got regulations, it's who controls it, who do you have to get approval from, then what are the standards for that? He wants to prove it can be done. The implications are, are huge of this in terms of whether it's monitoring for oil spills or 
transport and blood or whatever it may be in an emergency. In the case of our energy customers, they care about methane measurement. Our customer doesn't care about our unmanned aircraft. They care about an end deliverable. The industry does a great job at estimating what it does. It, it makes an assessment of the sort of leaks and things that it might have, and then it puts an estimate into the government, but it doesn't have a way of directly measuring. And so this is amazing because what this thing does is it flies out, no one has to go offshore, it flies out, it sits around the asset for about an hour, just flying round and round in circles making measurements, comes home and then it just gives them a really accurate measurement mm. of exactly what the emission of the facility was. There's going to be more and more of a need for us to, to track and map and understand our footprint, particularly around uh, greenhouse gases. You mentioned earlier that obviously your, your daughter's quite proud of everything you're doing and probably relays it in, in fairly layman's terms to her, her friends. What about the rest of the family? So they fully understand your ambition and where you actually want to take this? I think my, 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 my wife can see that it's what I love. So she knows that I'm a, an engineer and I love creating things. Yeah, as, as you say, my daughter is, uh, is very clear that I'm passionate about it. Um, my father's an engineer. So I, I, actually, to your point about do you realise how significant this is? I mean, my father held sort of various senior engineering roles, technical directors of big firms, and he, a couple of times, he's come down and said to me, you know, this is, this is amazing. You know, you should step back and see quite how significant uh, this is. They show me round, and it's amazing to me, you know, to see the technology of it. You know, I mean, there's an aircraft, the bit that he, he sort of loves, but the, there's the electronics, and testing, I mean, he's got a technical director now that tests everything, you know, wow. Life of Founder, yeah, is, is it difficult? Yeah, it's quite, there's quite a lot of uncertainty. So stuff is, is always changing around you. There aren't neat tram lines. And so you have to be prepared for surprises. The nature of, of providing aviation services, I always joke, it's sort of, uh, it's only one step lower pressure than space launch in that, you know, there's nowhere to hide. So when we run a mission, uh, it's very visible, the success or failure of that mission. Um, and that provides pressure on all of the team. He started FlyLogix uh, and thought it would be at a low level, but it's actually taken off. So it's been a tremendous pressure on his family and it's been a pressure on him. The people around you, your, your immediate family, probably suffer most because they're the people you can be completely straightforward with and so there is a danger that they just bear the brunt of a bad day where maybe it's a, it's a skill, isn't it, is to sort of step back and say, okay, you know, it's not been a great day today, um, but it'll be a good day tomorrow. It perhaps made me a little bit more patient about, you know, it takes time to build a better world. And I certainly would love, I would love for my daughter to be an engineer. I'll try and brain, brainwash her into it as much as I can. I've kind of always known that I'm an engineer, so ever since my first sort of technical Lego set when I was probably six. I've worked for engineering companies since I left university, and I guess it sort of dawned on me in the first five or six years that if you really wanted to change the world, you were going to need to do it in your own business, driving your own agenda rather than a cog in the machine. There's a funny story about Charlie that at school, a had tests to uh, determine what your sort of future career should be. And he said, look, I'm not, I'm not, we're not paying for the test. I don't need a test. I just want to be an engineer. My vision for FlyLogix is we will be the Boeing or the Airbus of, of unmanned uh, aircraft. And, you know, I think I looked it up the other day, Boeing employs 144,000 people. Um, and so we have a, a, a massive challenge to build that business, but we are on that path and I'm really excited about it. I think that this kind of technology, because it's applicable beyond oil and gas, it's really the limit of their imagination. It is important to me that we build something of significance, that we make, you know, we leave the world a better place than, than we found it. And, and that's what I feel we're, we're able to do here at FlyLogix. I'd ordered um, three identical items for my kids, all at the same time, all on the same platform, and each of those items had been received separately. They'd been delivered on three separate vehicles, and we ended up sending them back. So there were literally five journeys for, for that single order.
Rupert, my co-founder and I, we got chatting, I'd had a bad experience and we thought we could come up with a better idea. We knew that personally we were buying more stuff online, our families were buying more stuff online, all the people we knew were buying more, more stuff, so there had to be a better way to do it. Transport is central to how our economies are structured. We need to move things. People are thinking more consciously about um, what they buy, you know, where it's sourced from. And increasingly, they're looking at it from an end-to-end -end basis. What is the carbon footprint of my purchase? Hi, I'm Phil Davis. I'm co-founder and commercial director of Magway. Magway is a zero emission, all electric solution for delivering goods safely, securely, sustainably and affordably around the UK and internationally. I grew up in Manchester and father was a businessman, dreamed of to some extent following in his footsteps, having qualified with Deloitte and moved into strategy consulting, left Deloitte to set up my own business, I actually had previously had my own business at university, um, which was surprisingly successful. A friend and I um, went down to a football ground, main road um, that was, and started selling inflatable bananas outside the ground and were actually again discouraged by friends who thought we'd, you know, it's quite a rough place at the time and thought we'd, you know, get the living daylights kicked out of us. And it transpired again that, um, you know, people were just grabbing them out of our hands. We could, we were selling them as quickly as we could, as we could get them. And we ended up manufacturing and wholesaling. You know, that was a really exciting intro to business. What does home life look like now? I know you've got, is it three young kids? Three young kids, um, busy juggling, ferrying them around, um, unpaid Uber driver, of course. basically. Um, but lo lots of fun, lots of activities, lots of fun, um, lots of chaos, um, the normal, normal joys of, of a young family. The middle of last night, um, yeah, I was here with one of the other team members. We'd had a burst pipe. The front of the lobby was underwater. It was literally flowing out the front, the front door. And I'd just come from an entrepreneur's, I was at an entrepreneur's event where I got the call to say, we've got a burst water pipe. And, 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 and you're down here. In the early hours of the morning, get back home, and my daughter is lying on the landing. There's a post-it note on her cheek. And I look at it, I thought, you know, what, what's, what's the post-it note? And on it, she put, put me to bed, daddy. And that makes all those things worthwhile. It just puts things into perspective. Tell me about that conversation when you first came home and said, look, I've got this idea. It's a bit out there. I think she already thought I was a bit mad. <laughs> but she'd supported me in, in other businesses before. And as an entrepreneur, it can, it can make or break a relationship. And with your wife sort of now seeing what you're doing, do you think she fully understands your ambition, just how far you want to take this? She, she, gets, the, she gets the vision, she gets the ambition, she sees the potential. Yeah, as I said, there's no such thing as a slam dunk. We've got the opportunity. The opportunity mm. is there. Now we need to deliver on that opportunity. We're not going to stop people from ordering stuff. I think that is an unreasonable expectation. So on the assumption that we're going to continue buying stuff online, how do we make those deliveries more sustainable, more efficient, more accessible? What we're doing hasn't been done before, okay? We're bringing a new angle to logistics. The world is set on logistics being one type of way. We're now trying to introduce a better way. You wouldn't know from looking at the tenants, you've got a uniform shop here and the, yeah, and the, the a mix, kitchen. This used to be a center, one of the centers of technology in the UK. This was the old GC headquarters. Okay. We're now part of, sort of West London innovation hub uh, to try and reinvigorate and, and bring back uh, innovation to the area. So I assume 
these tracks or something similar will be above or preferably below ground, up and down motorways, say, train tracks, things like that. Right, so what, what we've done, if you, if you go over here, we've got a, a traditional utility pipe. Mm. This is old, tried and tested technology. Yeah, there's numerous companies that are laying this on an industrial scale across the country. And what we've done is combined it with, you know, leading edge technology mm. to make it uh, efficient and make it sustainable. These um, rings replicate the pipe that we're traveling through. Um, when, we, when we see it operate, you'll see them light up. So there's a safety procedure and then an operational procedure. They provide data in terms of the, the synchronicity mm. of the motors. We've, we've positioned the motors at regular spacings around the, around the truck. So there's 106 motors here, which basically are creating an electromagnetic wave. The intelligence is in the track and how we then manage those vehicles, but it's, um, it's an incredibly s simple and powerful idea. We've, we've stripped the fuel, the engine, the driver out of the vehicle. So what we have is a very efficient, low maintenance, low energy solution for transporting goods. So what, what's the knock-on effect of this then? So if we're taking the driver out of play here, what, what will that mean to roads in terms of lorries, vans? Fewer vehicles on the road, more open space, less congestion, more reliable deliveries, more affordable deliveries. Mm. We, we've got to be looking at a future without fossil fuels. I think that you know, the general consensus would support that. Initially, we're looking at a, a, a multi-user route through West London, from uh, Greenford all the way through to the Thames, and it'll have multiple drop-off points along the way. It would service over a million Londoners who would be within 15 minutes cycle or walk from a Magway hub to collect or have delivered or drop off goods. Then we want to use that as a template for other locations in the UK and also internationally. So we could look at connecting the UK, other countries, and connecting continents. There's nothing to stop us going underwater. Well, we're out here to change people's lives and we're out here to make the world a better place in a sense. So this is not something which is just within London or within the UK, it's global. And as a, we are people, we're for the people, so everyone's life will be changed. So if you, if you think about the scope of what we're trying to achieve, one distinction to be made is we're raising money to develop the technology, but the objective is to change the world. We look at other, you know, organizations operating in our space, and there's not that many, but they've been doing a lot longer. Uh, they've raised substantially more money. And I would say we are closer to realizing a commercial system than many larger organizations. I feel Magway could revolutionize several different transport infrastructures. Well, I want to make a mark. I want to have an impact. Um, I want to live a legacy. We say, you know, we want to look back and tell our grandchildren we did that. The greatest pressure comes from within you, because you, you, you drive yourself. We want to take it as far as we can to have as great an impact as it can. And I, and I know that if I do my job and we all do our job, they'll be installing magways long after I'm dead and buried. We're now moving more physical goods and data around the world more than ever before. The question is, how do we do that in a sustainable and efficient way? The real challenge is with such tight regulations around sustainability, safety, along with all the infrastructural needs, the end user doesn't really see innovation apart from a couple of times a century. These founders have the technology and the innovation to make all of this a reality. The big question now is, is society going to accept it as a fully-fledged business that truly changes the way we live?